This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. The Tale of Peter Rabbit by Beatrix Potter. Once upon a time there were four little rabbits, and their names were Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. They lived with their mother in a sand bank underneath the root of a very big fir tree. Now, my dears, said old Mrs. Rabbit one morning, you may go into the fields or down the lane, but don't go into Mr. McGregor's garden. Your father had an accident there. He was put in a pie. By Mrs. McGregor. Now run along and don't get into mischief. I am going out. Then old Mrs. Rabbit took a basket and her umbrella and went through the wood to the baker's. She bought a loaf of brown bread and five currant buns. Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail, who were good little bunnies, went down the lane to gather blackberries. But Peter, who was very naughty, ran straight away to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. First he ate some lettuces and some French beans, and then he ate some radishes, and then, feeling rather sick, he went to look for some parsley. But round the end of a cucumber frame, whom should he meet but Mr. McGregor? Mr. McGregor was on his hands and knees planting out young cabbages, but he jumped up and ran after Peter, waving a rake and calling out, Stop thief! Peter was most dreadfully frightened. He rushed all over the garden, for he had forgotten the way back to the gate. He lost one of his shoes among the cabbages, and the other shoe amongst the potatoes. After losing them, he ran on four legs and went faster, so that I think he might have got away altogether if he had not unfortunately run into a gooseberry net, and got caught by the large buttons on his jacket. It was a blue jacket, with brass buttons, quite new. Peter gave himself up for lost, and shed big tears, but his sobs were overheard by some friendly sparrows, who flew to him in great excitement, and implored him to exert himself. Mr. MacGregor came up with a sieve, which he intended to pop upon the top of Peter, but Peter wriggled out just in time, leaving his jacket behind him, and rushed into the tool-shed, and jumped into a can. It would have been a beautiful thing to hide in, if it had not had so much water in it. Mr. MacGregor was quite sure that Peter was somewhere in the tool-shed, perhaps hidden underneath a flower-pot. He began to turn them over carefully, looking under each. Presently Peter sneezed, Kachu! Mr. McGregor was after him in no time, and tried to put his foot upon Peter, who jumped out of a window, upsetting three plants. The window was too small for Mr. McGregor, and he was tired of running after Peter. He went back to his work. Peter sat down to rest. He was out of breath and trembling with fright, and he had not the least idea which way to go. Also he was very damp with sitting in that can. After a time he began to wander about, going lippity-lippity, not very fast, and looking all around. He found a door in a wall, but it was locked, and there was no room for a fat little rabbit to squeeze underneath. An old mouse was running in and out over the stone doorstep, carrying peas and beans to her family in the wood. Peter asked her the way to the gate, but she had such a large pea in her mouth that she could not answer. She only shook her head at him. Peter began to cry. Then he tried to find his way straight across the garden, but he became more and more puzzled. Presently he came to a pond where Mr. McGregor filled his water-cans. A white cat was staring at some goldfish. She sat very, very still, but now and then the tip of her tail twitched, as if it were alive. Peter thought it best to go away without speaking to her. He had heard about cats from his cousin, little Benjamin Bunny. He went back towards the tool-shed, but suddenly, quite close to him, he heard the noise of a hoe. Scritch, scratch, scratch, scritch. 
Peter scuttered underneath the bushes. But presently, as nothing happened, he came out, and climbed upon a wheelbarrow and peeped over. The first thing he saw was Mr. McGregor hoeing onions. His back was turned towards Peter, and beyond him was the gate. Peter got down very quietly off the wheelbarrow, and started running as fast as he could go, along a straight walk behind some black currant bushes. Mr. McGregor caught sight of him at the corner, but Peter did not care. He slipped underneath the gate, and was safe at last in the wood outside the garden. Mr. McGregor hung up the little jacket and the shoes for a scarecrow to frighten the blackbirds. Peter never stopped running or looked behind him till he got home to the big fir tree. He was so tired that he flopped down upon the nice soft sand on the floor of the rabbit hole and shut his eyes. His mother was busy cooking. She wondered what he had done with his clothes. It was the second little jacket and pair of shoes that Peter had lost in a fortnight. I am sorry to say that Peter was not very well during the evening. His mother put him to bed and made some chamomile tea, and she gave a dose of it to Peter. One tablespoonful to be taken at bedtime. But Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail had bread and milk and blackberries for supper. The end of Peter Rabbit. Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 5, 2006, in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tailor of Gloucester by Beatrix Potter. In the time of swords and periwigs and full-skirted coats with flowered lappets, when gentlemen wore ruffles and gold-laced waistcoats of pedersoy and taffeta, there lived a tailor in Gloucester. He sat in the window of a little shop in Westcote Street, cross-legged on a table from morning till dark. All day long, while the light lasted, he sewed and snippeted, piecing out his satin and pompadour and lute-string. Stuffs had strange names, and were very expensive in the days of the tailor of Gloucester. But although he sewed fine silk for his neighbours, he himself was very, very poor. A little old man in spectacles, with a pinched face, old crooked fingers and a suit of threadbare clothes. He cut his coats without waste, according to his embroidered cloth. They were very small ends and snippets that lay about upon the table. Two narrow breads for nowt, except waistcoats for mice, said the tailor. One bitter cold day near Christmas time, the tailor began to make a coat, a coat of cherry-coloured corded silk, embroidered with pansies and roses and a cream-coloured satin waistcoat, trimmed with gauze and green worsted chenille, for the mayor of Gloucester. The tailor worked and worked, and he talked to himself. He measured the silk and turned it round and round, and trimmed it into shape with his shears. The table was all littered with cherry-coloured snippets. No bread at all, and cut on the cross, it's no bread at all. Tippets for mice and ribbons for mobs, and for mice, said the tailor of Gloucester. When the snowflakes came down against the small leaded window panes and shut out the light, the tailor had done his day's work. All the silk and satin lay cut out upon the table. There were twelve pieces for the coat, and four pieces for the waistcoat. And there were pocket flaps and cuffs and buttons all in order. For the lining of the coat there was fine yellow taffeta, and for the buttonholes of the waistcoat there was cherry-coloured twist and everything was ready to sew together in the morning, all measured and sufficient, except that there was wanting just one single skein of cherry-coloured twisted silk. The tailor came out of his shop at dark, for he did not sleep there at nights. He fastened the window and locked the door and took away the key. No one lived there at night but little brown mice, and they run in and out without any keys. For behind the wooden wainscots of all the old houses in Gloucester, there are little mouse staircases and secret trapdoors, and the mice run from house to house through those long narrow passages. They can run all over the town without going into the streets. But the tailor came out of his shop 
and shuffled home through the snow. He lived quite nearby in College Court, next to the doorway to College Green, and although it was not a big house, the tailor was so poor he only rented the kitchen. He lived alone with his cat. It was called Simkin. Now all day long, while the tailor was out at work, Simpkin kept house by himself, and he was also fond of the mice, though he gave them no satin for coats. Meow, said the cat when the tailor opened the door. Meow. The tailor replied, Simkin, we shall make our fortune, but I am worn to a ravelling. Take this groat, which is our last fourpence, and Simkin, take a china pipkin, buy a penneth of bread, a penneth of milk, and a penneth of sausages. And oh, Simpkin, with the last penny of our fourpence, buy me one penneth of cherry-coloured silk. But do not lose the last penny of the fourpence, Simpkin, or I am undone and worn to a thread paper, for I have no more twist. Then Simpkin again said, Mmm, and took the groat and the pipkin and went out into the dark. The tailor was very tired and beginning to be ill. He sat down by the hearth and talked to himself about that wonderful coat. I shall make my fortune oh, to be cut by us. The mayor of Gloucester is to be married on Christmas Day in the morning and uh, he's ordered a coat and an embroidered waistcoat to be lined with yellow taffeta uh, and the taffeta suffices. There is no more left over in snippets that will serve to make tippets for mice. Then the tailor started, for suddenly, interrupting him, from the dresser at the other side of the kitchen came a number of little noises. Tip-tap, 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 tip. Now, what can that be? said the tailor of Gloucester, jumping up from his chair. The dresser was covered with crockery and pipkins, willow pattern plates and teacups and mugs. The tailor crossed the kitchen and stood quite still beside the dresser, listening and peering through his spectacles. Again from under a teacup came those funny little noises. Dip tap, dip tap, dip tap, dip. This is very peculiar, said the tailor of Gloucester, and he lifted up the teacup, which was upside down. Out stepped a little live lady mouse, and made a curtsy to the tailor. Then she hopped away down off the dresser and under the wainscot. The tailor sat down again by the fire, warming his poor cold hands and mumbling to himself. Horse cuts cut out from peach coloured satin, tamber stitch, and rosebuds in beautiful floss silk. Oh, was I wise to entrust my last fourpence to Simkin? One and twenty buttonholes of cherry coloured twist. But all at once, from the dresser, there came other little noises. Dip tap, dip tap, dip tap, dip. This is passing extraordinary, said the tailor of Gloucester and turned over another teacup, which was upside down. Out stepped a little gentleman mouse, made a bow to the tailor, and then from all over the dresser came a chorus of little tappings, all sounding together and answering one another, like watch beetles in an old worm-eaten window shutter. Dip-tap! Dip-tap! Dip-tap-dip! And out from under teacups, and from under bowls and basins, stepped other and more little mice, who hopped away down off the dresser and under the wainscot. The tailor sat down, close to the fire, lamenting. Oh, one and twenty buttonholes of cherry-coloured silk, to be finished by noon of Saturday, and, and this is Tuesday evening. Was it right to let loose those mice? Undoubtedly the property of Simkins. Oh, lack! I am undone, for I have no more twist. The little mice came out again, and listened to the tailor. They took notice of the pattern of that wonderful coat. They listened to one another about the taffeta lining, and about little mouse tippets. And then all at once they all ran away together down the passage behind the wainscot, squeaking and calling to one another, as they ran from house to house. And not one mouse was left in the tailor's kitchen when Simpkin came back with the pipkin of milk. Simpkin opened the door and bounced in with an angry Bow! like a cat that is vexed. For he hated the snow, and there was snow in his ears, and snow in his collar at the back of his neck. He put down the loaf and the sausages upon the dresser and sniffed. <laughs> Simpkin, said the tailor. 
Where's my twist? But Simpkin sat down the pippin and the milk upon the dresser, and looked suspiciously at the teacups. He wanted his supper of little fat mouse. Simpkin, said the tailor, where is my twist? But Simpkin hid a little parcel privately in the teapot, and spit and growled at the tailor. And if Simpkin had been able to talk, he would have asked, Where is my mouse? Alack, I am undone, said the tailor of Gloucester, and went sadly to bed. All that night long Simpkin hunted and searched through the kitchen, peeping into cupboards and under the wainscot, and into the teapot where he had hidden that twist. But still he never found a mouse. Whenever the tailor muttered and talked in his sleep, Simpkin went, Quang! and made strange, horrid noises, as cats do at night. For the poor old tailor was very ill with a fever, tossing and turning in his four-coast bed, and still in his dreams he mumbled, No more twist! No more twist! All that day he was ill, and the next day, and the next, and what should become of the cherry-coloured coat? In the tailor's shop in Westcott Street, the embroidered silk and satin lay cut out upon the table, one and twenty buttonholes, and who should come to sew them when the window was barred and the door was locked? But that does not hinder the little brown mice. They run in and out without any keys through all the old houses in Gloucester. Out of doors the market folks went trudging through the snow to buy their geese and turkeys and to bake their Christmas pies. But there'd be no Christmas dinner for Simpkin and the poor old tailor of Gloucester. The tailor lay ill for three days and nights. And when it was Christmas Eve, and very late at night, the moon climbed up over the roofs and chimneys, and looked down over the gateway into College Court. There were no lights in the windows, nor any sound in the houses. All the streets of Gloucester were fast asleep under the snow. And still Simpkin wanted his mice and he mewed as he stood beside the four-post bed. But it is in the old story that all the beasts can talk in the night between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in the morning, though there are very few folk that can hear them, or know what it is that they say. When the cathedral clock struck twelve, there was an answer, like an echo of the chimes, and Simpkin heard it, and came out of the tailor's door, and wandered about in the snow, from all the roofs and gables and old wooden houses in Gloucester came a thousand merry voices singing the old Christmas rhymes. All the old songs that ever I heard of, and some that I don't know, like Whittington's bells. First and loudest the cocks cried out, Dame, get up and bake your pies! Oh, dilly, 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 sighed Simkin. And now in a garret there were lights and sounds of dancing, and cats came from over the way. Hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle. All the cats in Gloucester, except me, said Simpkin. Under the wooden eaves, the starlings and sparrows sang of Christmas pies. The jackdaws woke up in the cathedral tower, and although it was the middle of the night, the throstles and robins sang. The air was quite full of little twittering tunes. But it was all rather provoking to poor hungry Simpkin. Particularly, he was vexed with some little shrill voices from behind a wooden lattice. I think they were bats, because they always have very small voices, especially in a black frost, when they talk in their sleep, like the tailor of Gloucester. They said something mysterious that sounded like, Buzz, quoth the blue fly, hum, quoth the bee, buzz and hum, they cry, and so do we. And Simpkin went away shaking his ears as if he had a bee in his bonnet. From the tailor's shop in Westcott came a glow of light, and when Simpkin crept up to peep in at the window, it was full of candles. There was a snippeting of scissors and snappeting of thread, and little mouse voices sang loudly and gaily. Four and twenty tailors went to catch a snail. Best man amongst them does not touch a tail. She put out her horns like a little kyla cow. Run, tailors, run, or she'll have you all in now. Then, without a pause, a little voice this went on again. Sif my lady's oatmeal, ground my lady's flour, put it in a chestnut, let it stand an hour. Meow, meow, interrupted Simkin, and he scratched at the door. But the key was under the tailor's pillow, and he could not get in. The little mice only laughed and tried another tune. Three little mice sat down to spin, 
Pussy passed by and she peeped in. What are you at, my little fine men, making coats for gentlemen? Shall I come in and cut off your threads? Oh no, Miss Pussy, you'd bite off our heads. <coughs> cried Simpkin. Heddle dignity, answered the little mice. Heddle dignity, puppety pet. Merchants of London, they wear scarlet. Silk in the collar and gold in the hem. So merrily marcheth the merchant man. They clicked their thimbles to march the time. But none of the songs pleased Simkin. He sniffed and mewed at the door of the shop. And then I bought a pipkin and a popkin, a slipkin and a slopkin, all for one farthing. And upon the kitchen dresser, added the rude little mice. <coughs> scratch, scratch, scuffled Simkin on the window sill. While well, the little mice inside sprang to their feet, and all began to shout at once in little twittering voices, No more twist! No more twist! And they barred up the window shutters, and shut out Simpkin. But still through the nicks in the shutters he could hear the click of thimbles, and little mouse voices singing, No more twist! No more twist! Simpkin came away from the shop and went home, considering in his mind. He found the poor old tailor without fever, sleeping peacefully, then Simpkin went on tiptoe, and took a little parcel of silk out of the teapot, and looked at it in the moonlight, and he felt quite ashamed of his badness, compared with those good little mice. When the tailor awoke in the morning, the first thing which he saw upon the patchwork quilt was a skein of jelly-coloured twisted silk, and beside his bed stood the repentant Simpkin. "'Alack, I am worn to a ravelling, said the tailor of Gloucester. "'But I, I have my twist!' The sun was shining on the snow when the tailor got up and dressed, and came out into the street with Simkin running before him. The starlings whistled on the chimney stacks, and the throstles and robins sang. But they sang their own little noises, not the words they had sung in the night. Alack, said the tailor, I have my twist, but no more strength, nor time, than will serve to make me one single buttonhole. For this is Christmas Day in the morning. The mayor of Gloucester shall be married by noon. And where is his cherry-coloured coat? He unlocked the door of the little shop in Westcote Street, and Simkin ran in like a cat that expects something. But there was no one there, not even one little brown mouse. The boards were swept clean. The little ends of thread and little silk snippets were all tidied away and gone from off the floor. But upon the table, oh joy, the tailor gave a shout. There, where he had left plain cuttings of silk, there lay the most beautifulest coat, an embroidered satin waistcoat that was ever worn by a mare of Gloucester. There were roses and pansies upon the facing of the coat, and the waistcoat was worked with poppies and cornflowers. Everything was finished except just one single cherry-coloured buttonhole, and where that buttonhole was wanting there was pinned a scrap of paper with these words in little tiny weeny writing, no more twist. And from then began the luck of the tailor of Gloucester. He grew quite stout, and he grew quite rich. He made the most wonderful waistcoats for all the merchants of Gloucester, and for all the fine gentlemen of the country round. Never were seen such ruffles, or such embroidered cuffs and lappets. But his buttonholes were the greatest triumph of all. The stitches of those buttonholes were so neat, so neat! I wonder how they could be stitched by an old man in spectacles, with crooked old fingers and a tailor's thimble. The stitches of those buttonholes were so small, so small, they looked as if they'd been made by little mice. The End This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sherry Crowther. The Great Big Treasury of Beatrix Potter by Beatrix Potter. Chapter 3 The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin. A Story for Nora. This is a tale about a tale, a tale that belonged to a little red squirrel, and his name was Nutkin. He had a brother called Twinkleberry, and a great many cousins. They lived in a wood at the edge of a lake. 
In the middle of the lake there is an island covered with trees and nuts and bushes, and amongst those trees stands a hollow oak tree, which is the house of an owl who is called Old Brown. One autumn, when the nuts were ripe, and the leaves on the hazel bushes were golden and green, Nutkin and Twinkleberry and all the other little squirrels came out of the wood and down to the edge of the lake. They made little rafts out of twigs, and they paddled away over the water to Owl Island to gather nuts. Each squirrel had a little sack and a large oar, and spread out his tail for a sail. They also took with them an offering of three fat mice as a present for Old Brown, and put them down upon his doorstep. Then Twinkleberry and the other little squirrels each made a low bow and said politely, Old Mr. Brown, will you favor us with permission to gather nuts upon your island? But Nutkin was excessively impertinent in his manners. He bobbed up and down like a little red cherry, singing, Riddle me, riddle me, rot tot tot, a little wee man in a red red coat, a staff in his hand and a stone in his throat. If you'll tell me this riddle, I'll give you a groat. Now this riddle is as old as the hills. Mr. Brown paid no attention whatever to Nutkin. He shut his eyes obstinately and went to sleep. The squirrels filled their little sacks with nuts and sailed home in the evening. But next morning they all came back again to Owl Island, and Twinkleberry and the others brought a fine fat mole and laid it on the stone in front of Old Brown's doorway and said, Mr. Brown, will you favor us with your gracious permission to gather some more nuts? But Nutkin, who had no respect, began to dance up and down, tickling old Mr. Brown with a nettle and singing, Old Mr. B, riddle me re, hitty pitty within the wall, hitty pitty without the wall, if you touch hitty pitty, hitty pitty will bite you. Mr. Brown woke up suddenly and carried the mole into his house. He shut the door in Nutkin's face. Presently a little thread of blue smoke from a wood fire came up from the top of the tree and Nutkin peeped through the keyhole and sang, A house full, a hole full, and you cannot gather a bowl full. The squirrels searched for nuts all over the island, and filled their little sacks, but Nutkin gathered oak apples, yellow and scarlet, and sat upon a beech stump playing marbles, and watching the door of old Mr. Brown. On the third day the squirrels got up very early and went fishing. They caught seven fat minnows as a present for Old Brown. They paddled over the lake and landed under a crooked chestnut tree on Owl Island. Twinkleberry and six other little squirrels each carried a fat minnow. But Nutkin, who had no nice manners, brought no present at all. He ran in front singing. The man in the wilderness said to me, How may strawberries grow in the sea? I answered him, as I thought good, as many red herrings as grow in the wood. But old Mr. Brown took no interest in riddles, not even when the answer was provided for him. On the fourth day the squirrels brought a present of six fat beetles, which were as good as plums in plum pudding for old Brown. Each beetle was wrapped up carefully in a dock leaf, fastened with a pine needle pin. But Nutkin sang as rudely as ever. Old Mr. B, riddle me re, flower of England, fruit of Spain, met together in a shower of rain, put in a bag tied round with a string. If you'll tell me this riddle, I'll give you a ring. Which was ridiculous of Nutkin, because he had not got any ring to give to Old Brown. The other squirrels hunted up and down the nut bushes, but Nutkin gathered Robin's pincushions off a briar bush and stuck them full of pine needle pins. On the fifth day the squirrels brought a present of wild honey. It was so sweet and sticky that they licked their fingers as they put it down upon the stone. They had stolen it out of a bumble bee's nest on the tippity top of the hill, but Nutkin skipped up and down, singing, 
Hum a bum, buzz buzz, hum a bum, buzz. All I went over tipple tine. I met a flock of bonny swine, some yellow nacked, some yellow backed. They were the very bonniest swine that ear went over the tipple tine. Old Mr. Brown turned up his eyes in disgust at the impertinence of Nutkin, but he ate up the honey. The squirrels filled their little sacks with nuts, but Nutkin sat upon a big flat rock and played nine pins with a crab apple and green fir cones. On the sixth day, which was Saturday, the squirrels came again for the last time. They brought a new laid egg in a little rush basket as a last parting present for old Brown. But Nutkin ran in front laughing and shouting, Humpty Dumpty lies in the beck with a white counterpane round his neck. Forty doctors and forty rights cannot put Humpty Dumpty to rights. Now old Mr. Brown took an interest in eggs. He opened one eye and shut it again, but still he did not speak. Nutkin became more and more impertinent. Old Mr. B, old Mr. B, hickamore, hackamore, on the king's kitchen door. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't drive hickamore, hackamore, off the king's kitchen door. Nutkin danced up and down like a sunbeam, but still old Brown said nothing at all. Nutkin began again. Arthur O'Bower has broken his band. He comes roaring up the land. The King of Scots, with all his power, cannot turn Arthur of the bower. Nutkin made a whirring noise to round like the wind, and he took a running jump right onto the head of old Brown. Then all at once there was a flutterment and a scufflement, and a loud squeak. The other squirrels scuttered away into the bushes. When they came back very cautiously, peeping round the tree, there was old Brown sitting on his doorstep quite still, with his eyes closed, as if nothing had happened. But Nutkin was in his waistcoat pocket. This looks like the end of the story, but it isn't. Old Brown carried Nutkin into his house, and held him up by the tail, intending to skin him. But Nutkin pulled so very hard that his tail broke in two, and he dashed up the staircase and escaped out of the attic window. And to this day, if you meet Nutkin up a tree and ask him a riddle, he will throw sticks at you and stamp his feet and scold and shout, "Cuck-cuck-cuck-cuck-cuck-cuck-cuck!" End of chapter three: The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Geva Pats, that's G E V A, on the LibriVox forums for feedback. The Tale of Benjamin Bunny by Beatrix Potter. One morning, a little rabbit sat on a bank. He pricked his ears and listened to the trit trot trick-trot of a pony. A gig was coming along the road. It was driven by Mr. McGregor, and beside him sat Mrs. McGregor in her best bonnet. As soon as they had passed, little Benjamin Bunny slid down into the road, and set off with a hop, skip and a jump to call upon his relations, who lived in the wood at the back of Mr. McGregor's garden. That wood was full of rabbit holes, and in the neatest, sandiest hole of all lived Benjamin's aunt and his cousins, Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. Old Mrs. Rabbit was a widow. She earned her living by knitting rabbit wool mittens and muffetees. I once bought a pair at a bazaar. She also sold herbs and rosemary tea and rabbit tobacco, which is what we call lavender. Little Benjamin did not very much want to see his aunt. He came round the back of the fir tree and nearly tumbled upon the top of his cousin Peter. Peter was sitting by himself. He looked poorly, and was dressed in a red cotton pocket handkerchief. Peter, said little Benjamin in a whisper, who has got your clothes? Peter replied, the scarecrow in Mr. McGregor's garden, and described how he'd been chased about the garden, and had dropped his shoes and coat. Little Benjamin sat down beside his cousin and assured him that Mr. McGregor had gone out in a gig, and Mrs. McGregor also, certainly for the day, 
because she was wearing her best bonnet. Peter said he hoped that it would rain. At this point, old Mrs. Rabbit's voice was heard inside the rabbit hole, calling, Cottontail! Cottontail! Fetch some more chamomile! Peter said he thought he might feel better if he went for a walk. They went away hand in hand and got upon the flat top of the wall at the bottom of the wood. From here, they looked down into Mr. McGregor's garden. Peter's coat and shoes were plainly to be seen upon the scarecrow, topped with an old tam shanter of Mr. McGregor's. Little Benjamin said, It spoils people's clothes to squeeze under a gate. The proper way to get in is to climb down a pear tree. Peter fell down head first, but it was of no consequence as the bed below was newly raked and quite soft. It had been sown with lettuces. They left a great many odd little footmarks all over the bed, especially little Benjamin, who was wearing clogs. Little Benjamin said that the first thing to be done was to get back Peter's clothes, in order that they might be able to use the pocket handkerchief. They took them off the scarecrow. There had been rain during the night. There was water in the shoes, and the coat was somewhat shrunk. Benjamin tried on the tam o shanter but it was too big for him. Then he suggested that they should fill the pocket handkerchief with onions as a little present for his aunt. Peter did not seem to be enjoying himself. He kept hearing noises. Benjamin, on the contrary, was perfectly at home, and he ate a lettuce leaf. He said that he was in the habit of coming to the garden with his father to get lettuces for their Sunday dinner. The name of little Benjamin's papa was old Mr. Benjamin Bunny. The lettuces certainly were very fine. Peter did not eat anything. He said he should like to go home. Presently he dropped half the onions. Little Benjamin said that it was not possible to get back up the pear tree with a load of vegetables. He led the way boldly towards the other end of the garden. They went along a little walk on planks under a sunny red brick wall. The mice sat on their doorsteps, cracking cherry stones. They winked at Peter Rabbit and little Benjamin Bunny. Presently, Peter let the pocket handkerchief go again. They got amongst flower pots and frames and tubs. Peter heard noises worse than ever. His eyes were as big as lollipops. He was a step or two in front of his cousin when he suddenly stopped. This is what those little rabbits saw around that corner. Little Benjamin took one look, and then, in half a minute less than no time, he hid himself and Peter and the onions underneath a large blanket. The cat got up and stretched herself and came and sniffed at the basket. Perhaps she liked the smell of onions. Anyway, she sat down upon the top of the basket. She sat there for five hours. I cannot draw you a picture of Peter and Benjamin underneath the basket, because it was quite dark, and because the smell of onions was fearful. It made Peter Rabbit and little Benjamin cry. The sun got round behind the wood, and it was quite late in the afternoon, but still the cat sat upon the basket. At length there was a pitter-patter, pitter-patter, and some bits of mortar fell from the wall above. The cat looked up and saw old Mr. Benjamin Bunny prancing along the top of the wall of the upper terrace. He was smoking a pipe of rabbit tobacco and had a little switch in his hand. He was looking for his son. Old Mr. Bunny had no opinion whatever of cats. He took a tremendous jump off the top of the wall onto the top of the cat and cuffed it off the basket and kicked it into the greenhouse, scratching off a handful of fur. The cat was too much surprised to scratch back. When old Mr. Bunny had driven the cat into the greenhouse, he locked the door. Then he came back to the basket and took out his son Benjamin by the ears and whipped him with a little switch. Then he took out his nephew, Peter. Then he took out the handkerchief of onions and marched out of the garden. When Mr. McGregor returned about half an hour later, he observed several things which perplexed him. It looked as though some person had been walking all over the garden in a pair of clogs, only the footmarks were too ridiculously little. Also, he could not understand how the cat could have managed to shut herself up inside the greenhouse, locking the door upon the outside. When Peter got home, his mother forgave him, because she was so glad to see that he had found his shoes and coat. Cottontail and Peter folded up the pocket handkerchief, and old Mrs. Rabbit strung up the onions and hung them from the kitchen ceiling, with the bunches of herbs and the rabbit tobacco. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please see LibriVox.org. The Tale of Two Bad Mice by Beatrix Potter Read by Hugh McGuire 
for W. M. L. W., the little girl who had the doll's house. Once upon a time there was a very beautiful doll's house. It was red brick with white windows, and it had real muslin curtains and a front door and a chimney. It belonged to two dolls called Lucinda and Jane. At least it belonged to Lucinda, but she never ordered meals. Jane was the cook, but she never did any cooking, because the dinner had been bought ready-made in a box full of shavings. There were two red lobsters, and a ham, a fish, a pudding, and some pears and oranges. They would not come off the plates, but they were extremely beautiful. One morning Lucinda and Jane had gone out for a drive in the doll's preambulator. There was no one in the nursery, and it was very quiet. Presently there was a little scuffling, scratching noise in the corner near the fireplace, where there was a hole under the skirting board. Tom Thumb put out his head for a moment, and then popped it in again. Tom Thumb was a mouse. A minute afterwards, Hunka Munka, his wife, put her head out, too. And when she saw that there was no one in the nursery, she ventured out on the oilcloth under the coal box. The doll's house stood at the other side of the fireplace. Tom Thumb and Hunka Munka went cautiously across the heart rug. They pushed the front door. It was not fast. Tom Thumb and Hunka Munka went upstairs and peeped into the dining room. Then they squeaked with joy. Such a lovely dinner was laid out upon the table. There were tin spoons and lead knives and forks and two dolly chairs, all so convenient. Tom Thumb set to work at once to carve the ham. It was a beautiful, shiny yellow, streaked with red. The knife crumpled up and hurt him. He put his finger to his mouth. It is not boiled enough. It is hard. You have a try, Hunka Munka. Hunka Munka stood up in her chair and chopped at the ham with another lead knife. It's as hard as the hams at the cheesemongers, said Hunka Munka. The ham broke off the plate with a jerk and rolled under the table. Let it alone, said Tom Thumb. Give me some fish, Hunka Munka. Hunka Munka tried every tin spoon in turn. The fish was glued to the dish. Then Tom Thumb lost his temper. He put the ham in the middle of the floor, and hit it with the tongs, and with the shovel. Bang, bang, smash, smash! The ham flew all into pieces, for underneath the shiny paint it was made of nothing but plaster. There was no end to the rage and disappointment of Tom Thumb and Hunka Munka. They broke up the pudding, the lobsters, the pears, and the oranges. As the fish would not come off the plate, they put it into the red-hot, crinkly paper fire in the kitchen. But it would not burn, either. Tom Thumb went up to the kitchen chimney and looked out at the top. There was no soot. While Tom Thumb was up the chimney, Hunka Munka had another disappointment. She found some tiny canisters upon the dresser, labeled rice, coffee, sago. But when she turned them upside down, there was nothing inside but red and blue beads. Then those mice set to work to do all the mischief they could, especially Tom Thumb. He took Jane's clothes out of the chest and drawers in her bedroom, and he threw them out of the top-floor window. But Hunka Munka had a frugal mind. After pulling half the feathers out of Lucinda's bolster, she remembered that she herself was in want of a feather bed. 
With Tom Thumb's assistance she carried the bolster downstairs, and across the hearthrug. It was difficult to squeeze the bolster into the mouse-hole, but they managed it somehow. Then Hunkamunka went back and fetched a chair, a bookcase, a birdcage, and several small odds and ends. The bookcase and the birdcage refused to go into the mouse-hole. Hunkamunka left them behind the coal-box and went to fetch a cradle. Hunkamunka was just returning with another chair when suddenly there was a noise of talking outside upon the landing. The mice rushed back to their hole. The dolls came into the nursery. What a sight met the eyes of Jane and Lucinda. Lucinda sat upon the upset kitchen stove and stared, and Jane leant against the kitchen dresser and smiled, but neither of them made any remark. The bookcase and the birdcage were rescued from under the coal-box, but Hunkamunka has got the cradle and some of Lucinda's clothes. She also has some useful pots and pans and several other useful things. The little girl that the doll's house belonged to said, I will get a doll and dressed like a policeman. But the nurse said, I will set a mouse-trap. So that is the story of the two bad mice. But they were not so very, very naughty after all, because Tom Thumb paid for everything he broke. He found a crooked sixpence under the hearth-rug, and upon Christmas Eve he and Hunkamunka stuffed it into one of the stockings of Lucinda and Jane. And very early every morning, before everyone is awake, Hunkamunka comes with her dustpan and her broom, to sweep up the dolly's house. End of the Tale of the Two Bad Mice This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tale of Mrs. Tiggywinkle by Beatrix Potter Once upon a time there was a little girl called Lucy, who lived at a farm called Littletown. She was a good little girl, only she was always losing her pocket handkerchiefs. One day Lucy came into the farmyard crying. Oh, she did cry so. I have lost my pocket hankin, three hankins and a penny. Have you seen them, Tabby Kitten? The kitten went on washing her white paws. So Lucy asked a speckled hen, Sally Henny Penny, have you found three pocket hankins? But the speckled hen ran into the barn clucking, I go barefoot, barefoot, barefoot. And then Lucy asked Cock Robin sitting on a twig. Cock Robin looked sideways at Lucy with his bright black eye, and he flew over a stile and away. Lucy climbed upon the stile and looked up at the hill behind Little Town, a hill that goes up up into the clouds, as though it had no top, and a great way up the hillside she thought she saw some white things spread upon the grass. Lucy scrambled up the hill as fast as her stout legs would carry her. She ran along a steep pathway up and up until Little Town was right away down below. She could have dropped the pebble down the chimney. Presently she came to a spring bubbling out from the hillside. Someone had stood a tin can upon a stone to catch the water, but the water was already running over, for the can was no bigger than an egg cup, and where the sand upon the path was wet, there were footmarks of a very small person. Lucy ran on and on. The path ended under a big rock. The grass was short and green, and there were clothes, props cut from bracken stems, with lines of plated rushes, and a heap of tiny clothespins but no pocket handkerchiefs. There was something else, a door, straight into the hill, and inside someone was singing, Lily white and clean, oh, with little frills between, oh, smooth and hot, red rusty spot, never here be seen, oh. Lucy knocked once, twice, and interrupted the song. A little frightened voice called out, Who's that? Lucy opened the door, and what do you think there was inside the hill? A nice clean kitchen, 
with a flagged floor and wooden beams, just like any other farm kitchen. Only the ceiling was so low that Lucy's head nearly touched it, and the pots and pans were small, and so was everything. There was a nice, hot, singy smell, and at the table, with an iron in her hand, stood a very stout, per short person, staring anxiously at Lucy. Her print gown was tucked up, and she was wearing a large apron over her striped petticoat. Her little black nose went sniffle, sniffle, snuffle, and her eyes went twinkle, twinkle, and underneath her cap, where Lucy had yellow curls, that little person had prickles. "'Who are you?' said Lucy. "'Have you seen my pocket hankins?' The little person made a bob curtsy. "'Oh, yes, if you please him. My name is Mrs. Tiggywinkle. Oh, yes, if you please him. I'm an excellent clean starcher.' and she took something out of a clothes basket and spread it on the ironing blanket. "'What's that thing?' said Lucy. "'That's not my pocket hankin.' "'Oh, no, if you please him. That's a little scarlet waistcoat belonging to Cock Robin.' And she ironed it and folded it and put it on one side. Then she took something else off a clothes horse. "'That isn't my penny,' said Lucy. "'Oh, no, if you please him. That's a damask tablecloth belonging to Jenny Wren. Look how it's stained with currant wine. It's very bad to wash, said Mrs. Tiggywinkle. Mrs. Tiggywinkle's nose went sniffle, sniffle, snuffle, and her eyes went twinkle, twinkle, and she fetched another hot iron from the fire. There's one of my pocket hankins, cried Lucy, and there's my penny. Mrs. Tiggywinkle ironed it and goffered it and shook out the frills. Oh, that is lovely, said Lucy. And what are those long yellow things with fingers like gloves? Oh, that's a pair of stockings belonging to Sally Hennypenny. Look how she's worn the heels out with scratching in the yard. She'll very soon go barefoot, said Mrs. Tiggywinkle. Why, there's another hanker sniff. But it isn't mine, it's red. Oh, no, if you please him. That one belongs to old Mrs. Rabbit, and it did so smell of onions. I've had to wash it separately. I can't get out the smell. There's another one of mine, said Lucy. What are those funny little white things? That's a pair of mittens belonging to Tabby Kitten. I only have to iron them. She washes them herself. There's my last pocket hankin, said Lucy. And what are you dipping into the basin of starch? There are little dicky shirt fronts belonging to Tom Titmouse. Most terrible particular, said Mrs. Tiggywinkle. Now I've finished my ironing, I'm going to air some clothes. What are these dear, soft, fluffy things, said Lucy? Oh, those are willy coats belonging to the little lambs of Skagel. Will their jackets take off, asked Lucy. Oh, yes, if you please them. Look at the sheep mark on the shoulder. And here's one marked for Gatesgarth, and three that come from Littletown. They're always marked at washing, said Mrs. Tiggywinkle. And she hung up all sorts and sizes of clothes, small brown coats of mice, and one velvety black moleskin waistcoat, and a red tailcoat with no tail belonging to Squirrel Nutkin, and a very much shrunk blue jacket belonging to Peter Rabbit, and a petticoat, not marked, that had gone lost in the washing, and at last the basket was empty. Then Mrs. Tiggywinkle made tea, a cup for herself and a cup for Lucy. They sat before the fire on a bench and looked sideways at one another. Mrs. Tiggywinkle's hand, holding the teacup, was very, very brown and very, very wrinkly with soap suds. And all through her gown and her cap there were hairpins sticking wrong end out, so that Lucy didn't like to sit too near her. When they had finished tea, they tied up the clothes in bundles, and Lucy's pocket handkerchiefs were folded up inside her clean penny and fastened with a silvery safety pin. And then they made up the fire with turf and came out and locked the door and hid the key under the door sill. Then away down the hill trotted Lucy and Mrs. Tiggywinkle with the bundle of clothes. All the way down the path, little animals came out of the fern to meet them. 
the very first they met were Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Bunny. And she gave them their nice clean clothes, and all the little animals and birds were so very much obliged to dear Mrs. Tiggywinkle. So that at the bottom of the hill, when they came to the stile, there was nothing left to carry except Lucy's one little bundle. Lucy scrambled up the stile with the bundle in her hand, and then she turned to say good night and to thank the washerwoman. But what a very odd thing! Mrs. Tiggywinkle had not waited either for thanks or for the washing bill. She was running, running, running up the hill. And where was her white frilled cap, and her shawl, and her gown, and her petticoat? And how small she had grown, and how brown! and covered with prickles. Why, Mrs. Tiggywinkle was nothing but a hedgehog. Now, some people say that little Lucy had been asleep upon the stile. But then, how could she have found three clean pocket hankins and a penny, pinned with a silver safety pin? And besides, I have seen that door into the back of the hill called Cat Bells, and besides, I am very well acquainted with dear Mrs. Tiggywinkle. End of the Tale of Mrs. Tiggywinkle by Beatrix Potter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Complete Tales of Beatrix Potter Number 7. The Pie and the Patty Pan Pussycat sits by the fire. How should she be fair? In walks the little dog. Says, Miss Pussy, are you there? How do you, Mistress Pussy? Mistress Pussy, how do you do? I thank you kindly, little dog. I fare as well as you. Old Rhyme Once upon a time there was a pussy cat called Ribby, who invited a little dog called Duchess to tea. Come in good time, my dear Duchess, said Ribby's letter, and we will have something so very nice. I am baking it in a pie dish, a pie dish with a pink rim. You never tasted anything so good, and you shall eat it all. I will eat muffins, my dear Duchess, wrote Ribby. "'I will come very punctually, my dear Ribby,' wrote Duchess, and then at the end she added, "'I hope it isn't Mouse,' and then she thought it did not look quite polite, so she scratched out, "'Isn't Mouse,' and changed it to, "'I hope it will be fine,' and she gave her letter to the postman. But she thought a great deal about Ribby's pie, and she read Ribby's letter over and over again. "'I'm dreadfully afraid it will be Mouse,' said Duchess to herself. "'I really couldn't, couldn't eat Mouse pie, and I shall have to eat it because it is a party.' and my pie was going to be veal and ham, a pink and white pie dish, and so was mine, just like Ribby's dishes. They were both bought at Tabitha Titchwitz. Duchess went into her larder and took a pie off the shelf and looked at it. Oh, what a good idea! Why shouldn't I rush along and put my pie into Ribby's oven when Ribby isn't there? Ribby, in the meantime, had received Duchess's answer, and as soon as she was sure the little dog would come, she popped her pie into the oven. There were two ovens, one above the other, some other knobs and handles were only ornamental and not intended to open. Ribby put the pie in the lower oven. The door was very stiff. The top oven bakes too quickly, said Ribby to herself. Ribby put on some coal and swept the hearth. Then she went out with the can to the well for water to fill up the kettle. Then she began to set the room in order, for it was the sitting room as well as the kitchen. When Ribby had laid the table, she went out down the field to the farm to fetch milk and butter. When she came back, she peeped into the bottom oven. The pie looked very comfortable. Ribby put on her shawl and bonnet and went out again with a basket to the village shop to buy a packet of tea, a pound of lump sugar, and a pot of marmalade. And just at the same time Duchess came out of her house at the other end of the village. Ribby met Duchess halfway down the street, also carrying a basket covered with a cloth. They only bowed to one another. They did not speak, because they were going to have a party. As soon as Duchess had got round the corner out of sight, she simply ran straight away to Ribby's house. Ribby went into the shop and bought what she required, and came out after a pleasant gossip with cousin Tabitha Titchwit. Ribby went on to Timothy Baker's and bought the muffins. Then she went home. There seemed to be a sort of scuffling noise in the back passage, as she was coming in at the front door, but there was nobody there. Duchess, in the meantime, had slipped out the back door. It is a very odd thing that Ribby's pie was not in the oven when I put mine in, and I can't find it anywhere. I have looked all over the house. I put my pie into a nice hot oven at the top. "'I could not turn any of the other handles. "'I think they are all shams,' said Duchess. "'But I wish I could have removed a pie made of mouse. "'I cannot think what she has done with it. "'I heard Ribby coming, and I had to run out the back door.' 
Duchess went home and brushed her beautiful black coat, and then she picked a bunch of flowers in her garden as a present for Ribby, and passed the time until the clock struck four. Ribby, having assured herself by careful search that there really was no one hiding in the cupboard or in the larder, went upstairs to change her dress. She came downstairs again and made the tea, and put the teapot on the hob. She peeped into the bottom oven. The pie had become a lovely brown and was steaming hot. She sat down before the fire to wait for the little dog. "'I'm glad I used the bottom oven,' said Ribby. "'The top one would certainly have been much too hot.' Very punctually at four o'clock, Duchess started to go to the party. At quarter past four to the minute, there came an almost genteel little tappity-tap. "'Is Miss Ribston at home?' inquired Duchess in the porch. "'Come in, and how do you do, my dear Duchess?' cried Ribby. "'I hope I see you well.' "'Quite well, I thank you. And how do you do, my dear Ribby?' said Duchess. "'I have brought you some flowers. What a delicious smell of pie!' "'Oh, what lovely flowers! Yes, it is mouse and bacon!' "'I think it wants another five minutes,' said Ribby. "'Just a shade longer. I will pour out the tea while we wait. Do you take sugar, my dear Duchess?' "'Oh, yes, please, my dear Ribby. And may I have a lump upon my nose?' "'With pleasure, my dear Duchess.' Duchess sat up with the sugar on her nose and sniffed. "'Oh, how good that pie smells! I do love veal and ham. I meant to say mouse and bacon.' She dropped the sugar in confusion, and had to go hunting under the tea-table, so did not see which oven Ribby opened in order to get out the pie. Ribby set the pie upon the table. There was a very savoury smell. Duchess came out from under the tablecloth munching sugar, and sat up on a chair. "'I will first cut the pie for you. I'm going to have a muffin and marmalade,' said Ribby. "'I think,' thought Duchess to herself, "'I think it would be wiser if I helped myself to pie, "'though Ribby did not seem to notice anything when she was cutting it. "'What very small, fine pieces it has cooked into! "'I did not remember that I had minced it up so fine. "'I suppose this is a quicker oven than my own.' "'The pie-dish was emptying rapidly. "'Duchess had had four helps already, and was fumbling with the spoon. "'A little more bacon, my dear Duchess,' said Ribby. "'Thank you, my dear Ribby. "'I was only feeling for the patty-pan.' "'The patty-pan, my dear Duchess?' "'The patty-pan that held up the pie-crust,' said Duchess, blushing under her black coat. "'Oh, I didn't put one in, my dear Duchess,' said Ribby. "'I don't think that it is necessary in pies made of mouse.' Duchess fumbled with the spoon. "'I can't find it,' she said anxiously. "'There isn't a patty-pan,' said Ribby, looking perplexed. "'Yes, indeed, my dear Ribby, where can it have gone to?' said Duchess. Duchess looked very much alarmed, and continued to scoop the inside of the pie-dish. "'I have only four patty-pans, and they are all in the cupboard.' Duchess set up a howl. "'I shall die! I shall die! I have swallowed a patty-pan! Oh, my dear Ribby, I do feel so ill!' "'It is impossible, my dear Duchess. There was not a patty-pan.' "'Yes, there was, my dear Ribby. I am sure I have swallowed it.' "'Let me prop you up with a pillow, my dear Duchess. Where do you think you feel it?' "'Oh, I do feel so ill all over me, my dear Ribby. Shall I run for the doctor?' "'Oh, yes, yes. Fetch Dr. Maggotty, my dear Ribby. He is a pie himself. You will certainly understand.' Ribby settled Duchess in an armchair before the fire, and went out and hurried to the village to look for the doctor. She found him at the smithy. Ribby explained that her guest had swallowed a patty-pan. Dr. Maggotty hopped so fast that Ribby had to run. It was most conspicuous. All the village could see that Ribby was fetching the doctor. But while Ribby had been hunting for the doctor, a curious thing had happened to Duchess, who had been left by herself, sitting before the fire, sighing and groaning and feeling very unhappy. "'How could I have swallowed it, such a large thing as a patty-pan?' She sat down again and stared mournfully at the grate. The fire crackled, danced, and something sizzled. Duchess started. She opened the door of the top oven. Out came a rich, steamy flavor of veal and ham, and there stood a fine brown pie, and through the hole in the top of the pie-crust was a glimpse of a little tin patty-pan. Duchess drew a long breath. "'Then it must have been eating mouse! No wonder I feel ill! But perhaps I should feel worse if I had really swallowed a patty-pan,' Duchess reflected." "'What a very awkward thing to have to explain to Ribby. "'I think I will put my pie in the back yard and say nothing about it. "'When I go home, I will run round and take it away.' "'She put it outside the back door and sat down again by the fire and shut her eyes. "'When Ribby arrived with the doctor, she seemed fast asleep. "'I'm feeling very much better,' said Duchess, waking up with a jump. "'I'm truly glad to hear it. He has brought you a pill, my dear Duchess.' "'I think I should feel quite well if he only felt my pulse,' said Duchess, backing away from the magpie, who sidled up with something in his beak. "'It is only a bread-pill. You had much better take it. Drink a little milk, my dear Duchess.' "'I'm feeling very much better, my dear Ribby,' said Duchess. "'Do you not think that I had better go home before it gets dark? Perhaps it might be wise, my dear Duchess.' 
Ruby and Duchess said goodbye affectionately, and Duchess started home. Halfway up the lane she stopped and looked back. Ribby had gone in and shut her door. Duchess slipped through the fence and ran round the back of Ribby's house and peeped into the yard. Upon the roof of the pigsty sat Dr. Maggotty and three jackdaws. The jackdaws were eating pie crust, and the magpie was drinking gravy out of a patty pan. Duchess ran home feeling uncommonly silly. When Ribby came out for a pail full of water and to wash up the tea things, she found a pink and white pie dish lying smashed in the middle of the yard. Ribby stared with amazement. Did you ever see the like? So there really was a patty pan? But my patty pans are all in the kitchen cupboard. Well, I never did. Next time I want to give a party, I will invite Cousin Tabitha Twitchit. End The Pie in the Patty Pan The Complete Tales of Beatrix Potter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Jed Brewster. The Tale of Mr. Jeremy Fisher by Beatrix Potter Once upon a time there was a frog called Mr. Jeremy Fisher. He lived in a little damp house amongst the buttercups at the edge of a pond. The water was all slippy-sloppy in the larder and in the back passage. But Mr. Jeremy liked getting his feet wet. Nobody ever scolded him, and he never caught a cold. He was quite pleased when he looked out and saw large drops of rain splashing in the pond. I will get some worms and go fishing and catch a dish of minnows for my dinner, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. If I catch more than five fish, I will invite my friends Mr. Alderman Ptolemy Tortoise and Sir Isaac Newton. The alderman, however, eats salad. Mr. Jeremy put on a Macintosh and a pair of shiny galoshes. He took his rod and basket and set off with enormous hops to the place where he kept his boat. The boat was round and green and very like the other lily leaves. It was tied to a water plant in the middle of the pond. Mr. Jeremy took a reed pole and pushed the boat out into open water. I know a good place for minnows, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. Mr. Jeremy stuck his pole into the mud and fastened the boat to it. Then he settled himself cross-legged and arranged his fishing tackle. He had the dearest little red float. His rod was a tough stalk of grass. His line was a fine, long, white horsehair, and he tied a little wriggling worm at the end. The rain trickled down his back, and for nearly an hour he stared at the float. This is getting tiresome. I think I should like some lunch, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. He punted back again amongst the water plants and took some lunch out of his basket. I will eat a butterfly sandwich and wait till the shower is over, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. A great big water beetle came up underneath the lily leaf and tweaked the toe of one of his galoshes. Mr. Jeremy crossed his legs up shorter, out of reach, and went on eating his sandwich. Once or twice something moved about with a rustle and a splash amongst the rushes at the side of the pond. I trust that is not a rat, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. I think I had better get away from here. Mr. Jeremy shoved the boat out again a little way and dropped in the bait. There was a bite almost directly. The float gave a tremendous bobbit. A minnow, a minnow! I have him by the nose, cried Mr. Jeremy Fisher, jerking up his rod. But what a horrible surprise! Instead of a smooth, fat minnow, Mr. Jeremy landed little Jack Sharp, the stickleback, covered with spines. The stickleback floundered about the boat, pricking and snapping until he was quite out of breath. Then he jumped back into the water and a shoal of other little fishes put their heads out and laughed at Mr. Jeremy Fisher. 
and while Mr. Jeremy sat disconsolately on the edge of his boat, sucking his sore fingers and peering down into the water, a much worse thing happened. A really frightful thing it would have been if Mr. Jeremy had not been wearing a Macintosh. A great, big, enormous trout came up, kerfluff, with a splash, and it seized Mr. Jeremy with a snap. Ow! 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 And then it turned and dived down to the bottom of the pond. But the trout was so displeased with the taste of the Macintosh that in less than half a minute it spat him out again, and the only thing it swallowed was Mr. Jeremy's galoshes. Mr. Jeremy bounced up to the surface of the water like a cork and the bubbles out of a soda water bottle, and he swam with all his might to the edge of the pond. He scrambled out on the first bank he came to, and he hopped home across the meadow with his Macintosh all in tatters. What a mercy that was not a pike, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. I have lost my rod and basket, but it does not much matter, for I am sure I should never have dared to go fishing again. He put some sticking plaster on his fingers, and his friends both came to dinner. He could not offer them fish, but he had something else in his larder. Sir Isaac Newton wore his black and gold waistcoat, and Mr. Alderman Ptolemy Tortoise brought a salad with him in a string bag. And instead of a nice dish of minnows, they had a roasted grasshopper with ladybird sauce, which frogs consider a beautiful treat. But I think it must have been nasty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brad Bush. A Great Big Treasury of Beatrice Potter by Beatrice Potter. The Story of a Fierce Bad Rabbit. This is a fierce bad rabbit. Look at his savage whiskers and his claws, and his turned-up tail. This is a nice gentle rabbit. His mother has given him a carrot. The bad rabbit would like some carrot. He doesn't say please. He takes it, and scratches the good rabbit very badly. The good rabbit creeps away and hides in a hole. It feels sad. This is a man with a gun. He sees something sitting on a bench. He thinks it is a very funny bird. He comes creeping up behind the trees, and then he shoots. Bang! This is what happens. But this is all he finds on the bench when he rushes up with his gun. The good rabbit peeps out of his hole and sees the bad rabbit tearing past without any tail or whiskers. The End of the Story of the Fierce Bad Rabbit
Last Supper. No person was to be seen, and no young rabbits. The kitchen was empty and silent. The clock had run down. Peter and Benjamin flattened their noses against the window and stared into the dusk. Then they scrambled round the rocks to the other side of the house. It was damp and smelly and overgrown with thorns and briars. The rabbits shivered in their shoes. Oh, my poor rabbit babies. What a dreadful place. I shall never see them again, sighed Benjamin. They crept up to the bedroom window. It was closed and bolted like the kitchen, but there were signs that the window had been recently opened. The cobwebs were disturbed, and there were fresh, dirty footmarks upon the window sill. The room inside was so dark that at first they could make out nothing, but they could hear a noise, a slow, deep, regular, snoring grunt. And as their eyes became accustomed to the darkness, they perceived that somebody was asleep on Mr. Todd's bed, curled up under the blanket. He has gone to bed in his boots, whispered Peter. Benjamin, who is all of a witter, pulled Peter off the window sill. Tommy Brock's snores continued, grunty and regular from Mr. Todd's bed. Nothing could be seen of the young family. The sun had set, an owl began to hoot in the wood. There were many unpleasant things lying about that had much better have been buried. Rabbit bones and skulls and chicken legs and other horrors. It was a shocking place and very dark. They went back to the front of the house and tried in every way to move the bolt of the kitchen window. They tried to push up a rusty nail between the window sashes, but it was of no use, especially without light. They sat side by side outside the window, whispering and listening. In half an hour the moon rose over the wood, it shone full and clear and cold upon the house, amongst the rocks and in at the kitchen window. But alas, no little rabbit babies were to be seen. The moonbeams twinkled on the carving knife and the pie dish and made a path of brightness across the dirty floor. A light showed a little door in a wall beside the kitchen fireplace, a little iron door belonging to a brick oven of that old-fashioned sort that used to be heated with faggots of wood. And presently, at the same moment, Peter and Benjamin noticed that whenever they shook the window, the little door opposite shook in answer. The young family were alive, shut up in the oven. Benjamin was so excited that it was a mercy he did not awake Tommy Brock, whose snores continued solemnly in Mr. Todd's bed. But there really was not very much comfort in the discovery. They could not open the window, and although the young family was alive, the little rabbits were quite incapable of letting themselves out. They were not old enough to crawl. After much whispering, Peter and Benjamin decided to dig a tunnel. They began to burrow a yard or two lower down the bank. They hoped they might be able to work between the large stones under the house. The kitchen floor was so dirty that it was impossible to say whether it was made of earth or flags. They dug and dug for hours. They could not tunnel straight on account of stones. 
but by the end of the night they were under the kitchen floor. Benjamin was on his back scratching upwards. Peter's claws were worn down. He was outside the tunnel shuffling sand away. He called out that it was morning, sunrise, and that the jays were making a noise down below in the woods. Benjamin Bunny came out of the dark tunnel shaking the sand from his ears. He cleaned his face with his paws. Every minute the sun shone warmer on the top of the hill. In the valley there was a sea of white mist with golden tops of trees showing through. Again from the fields down below in the mist, there came the angry cry of a jay, followed by the sharp, yelping bark of a fox. Then those two rabbits lost their heads completely. They did the most foolish thing that they could have done. They rushed into their short new tunnel and hid themselves at the top end of it, under Mr. Todd's kitchen floor. Mr. Todd was coming up Bull Banks, and he was in the very worst of tempers. First he had been upset by breaking the plate. It was his own fault, but it was a china plate, the last of the dinner service that had belonged to his grandmother, old Vixen Todd. Then the midges had been very bad, and he had failed to catch a hen pheasant on her nest, and it had contained only five eggs, two of them addled. Mr. Todd had had an unsatisfactory night. As usual, when out of humor, he determined to move house. First he tried the pollard willow, but it was damp, and the otters had left a dead fish near it. Mr. Todd likes nobody's leavings but his own. He made his way up the hill. His temper was not improved by noticing unmistakable marks of a badger. No one else grubs up the moss so wantonly as Tommy Brock. Mr. Todd slapped his stick upon the earth and fumed. He guessed where Tommy Brock had gone to. He was further annoyed by the jaybird, which followed him persistently. It flew from tree to tree and scolded, warning every rabbit within hearing that either a cat or a fox was coming up the plantation. Once when it flew screaming over his head, Mr. Todd snapped at it and barked. He approached his house very carefully, with a large rusty key he sniffed, and his whiskers bristled. The house was locked up, but Mr. Todd had his doubts whether it was empty. He turned the rusty key in the lock, and the rabbits below could hear it. Mr. Todd opened the door cautiously and went in. The sight that met Mr. Todd's eyes in Mr. Todd's kitchen made Mr. Todd furious. There was Mr. Todd's chair and Mr. Todd's pie dish, and his knife and fork and mustard and salt cellar, and his tablecloth that he had left folded up in the dresser, all out for supper or breakfast, without doubt for that odious Tommy Brock. There was a smell of fresh earth and dirty badger, which fortunately overpowered all smell of rabbit. But what absorbed Mr. Todd's attention was a noise, a deep, slow, regular snoring, grunting noise coming from his own bed. He peeped through the hinges of the half-open bedroom door, then he turned and came out of the house in a hurry. His whiskers bristled and his coat collar stood on end with rage. 
For the next 20 minutes, Mr. Todd kept creeping cautiously into the house and retreating hurriedly out again. By degrees, he ventured further in, right into the bedroom. When he was outside the house, he scratched up the earth with fury, but when he was inside, he did not like the look of Tommy Brock's teeth. He was lying on his back with his mouth open, grinning from ear to ear. He snored peacefully and regularly, but one eye was not perfectly shut. Mr. Todd came in and out of the bedroom. Twice he brought in his walking stick, and once he brought in the coal scuttle. But he thought better of it and took them away. When he came back after removing the coal scuttle, Tommy Brock was lying a little more sideways, but he seems even sounder asleep. He was an incurably indolent person. He was not in the least afraid of Mr. Todd. He was simply too lazy and comfortable to move. Mr. Todd came back yet again into the bedroom with a clothesline. He stood a minute watching Tommy Brock and listened attentively to the snores. They were very loud indeed, but seemed quite natural. Mr. Todd turned his back towards the bed and undid the window. It creaked. He turned around with a jump. Tommy Brock, who had opened one eye, shut it hastily. The snores continued. Mr. Todd's proceedings were peculiar and rather difficult because the bed was between the window and the door of the bedroom. He opened the window a little way and pushed out the greater part of the clothesline onto the window sill. The rest of the line, with a hook at the end, remained in his hand. Tommy Brock snored conscientiously. Mr. Todd stood and looked at him for a minute. Then he left the room again. Tommy Brock opened both eyes and looked at the rope and grinned. There was a noise outside the window. Tommy Brock shut his eyes in a hurry. Mr. Todd had gone out at the front door and round to the back of the house. On the way, he stumbled over the rabbit burrow. If he had had any idea who was inside it, he would have pulled them out quickly. His foot went through the tunnel, nearly upon the top of Peter Rabbit and Benjamin. But, fortunately, he thought that it was some more of Tommy Brock's work. He looked upon the coil of line from the sill, listened for a moment, and then tied the rope to a tree. Tommy Brock watched him with one eye through the window. He was puzzled. Mr. Todd fetched a large, heavy pail full of water from the spring and staggered with it through the kitchen into his bedroom. Tommy Brock snored industriously with rather a snort. Mr. Todd put down the pail beside the bed, took up the end of the rope with the hook, hesitated, and looked at Tommy Brock. The snores were almost apoplectic, but the grin was not quite so big. Mr. Todd gingerly mounted a chair by the head of the bedstead. His legs were dangerously near to Tommy Brock's teeth. He reached up and put the end of the rope with the hook over the head of the tester bed, where the curtains ought to hang. Mr. Todd's curtains were folded up and put away, owing to the house being unoccupied. So was the counterpane. Time Brock was covered with a blanket only. Mr. Todd, standing on the unsteady chair, looked down upon him attentively. He really was a first prize sound sleeper. 
It seemed as though nothing would waken him, not even the flapping rope across the bed. Mr. Todd descended safely from the chair and endeavored to get up again with the pail of water. He intended to hang it from the hook dangling over the head of Tommy Brock in order to make a sort of shower bath worked by a string through the window. But naturally, being a thin-legged person, though vindictive and sandy-whiskered, he was quite unable to lift the heavy weight to the level of the hook and rope. He very nearly overbalanced himself. The snores became more and more apoplectic. One of Tommy Brock's hind legs twitched under the blanket, but he still slept on peacefully. Mr. Todd and the pail descended from the chair without accident. After considerable thought, he emptied the water into a wash basin and jug. The empty pail was not too heavy for him. He slung it up, wobbling over the head of Tommy Brock. Surely there never was such a sleeper. Mr. Todd got up and down, down and up on the chair. As he could not lift the whole pail full of water at once, he fetched a milk jug and ladled quarts of water into the pail by degrees. The pail got fuller and fuller and swung like a pendulum. Occasionally a drop splashed over, but still Tommy Brock snored regularly and never moved except in one eye. At last, Mr. Todd's preparations were complete. The pail was full of water. The rope was tightly strained over the top of the bed and across the windowsill to the tree outside. It will make a great mess in my bedroom, but I could never sleep in that bed again without a spring cleaning of some sort, said Mr. Todd. Mr. Todd took a last look at the badger and softly left the room. He went out of the house, shutting the front door. The rabbits heard his footsteps over the tunnel. He ran round behind the house, intending to undo the rope in order to let fall the pail full of water upon Tommy Brock. I will wake him up with an unpleasant surprise said Mr. Todd. The moment he had gone, Tommy Brock got up in a hurry. He rolled Mr. Todd's dressing gown into a bundle, put it into the bed beneath the pail of water instead of himself, and left the room also, grinning immensely. He went into the kitchen, lighted the fire, and boiled the kettle. For the moment, he did not trouble himself to cook the baby rabbits. When Mr. Todd got to the tree, he found that the weight and strain had dragged the knot so tight it was past untying. He was obliged to gnaw it with his teeth. He chewed and gnawed for more than twenty minutes. At last the rope gave way with a sudden jerk that it nearly pulled his teeth out and quite knocked him over backwards. Inside the house there was a great crash and splash and the noise of a pail rolling over and over. But no screams. Mr. Todd was mystified. He sat quite still and listened attentively. Then he peeped in at the window. The water was dripping from the bed. The pail had rolled into a corner. In the middle of the bed under the blanket was a wet something, much flattened in the middle, where the pail had caught it, as it were across the tummy. Its head was covered by the wet blanket, and it was not snoring any longer. There was nothing stirring, no sound, except the drip, drop, drop, drip, of water trickling from the mattress. Mr. Todd watched it for half an hour. His eyes glistened. 
Then he cut a caper and became so bold that he even tapped at the window, but the bundle never moved. Yes, there was no doubt about it. It had turned out even better than he had planned. The pail had hit poor old Tommy Brock and killed him dead. I will bury that nasty person in the hole which he has dug. I will bring my bedding out and dry it in the sun, said Mr. Todd. I will wash the tablecloth and spread it on the grass in the sun to bleach, and the blanket must be hung up in the wind, and the bed must be thoroughly disinfected and aired with a warming pan and warmed with a hot water bottle. I will get soft soap and monkey soap and all sorts of soap and soda and scrubbing brushes and Persian powder and carbolic to remove the smell. I must have a disinfecting. Perhaps I may have to burn sulfur. He hurried round the house to get a shovel from the kitchen. First I will arrange the hole, then I will drag out that person in the blanket. He opened the door. Tommy Brock was sitting at Mr. Todd's kitchen table pouring out tea from Mr. Todd's teapot into Mr. Todd's teacup. He was quite dry himself and grinning, and he threw the cup of scalding tea all over Mr. Todd. Then Mr. Todd rushed upon Tommy Brock, and Tommy Brock grappled with Mr. Todd against the broken crockery. And there was a terrific battle all over the kitchen. To the rabbits underneath, it sounded as if the floor would give way at each crash of falling furniture. They crept out of their tunnel and hung about amongst the rocks and bushes, listening anxiously. Inside the house, the racket was fearful. The rabbit bunnies in the oven woke up trembling. Perhaps it was fortunate they were shut up inside. Everything was upset except the kitchen table, and everything was broken except the mantelpiece and the kitchen fender. The crockery was smashed to atoms. The chairs were broken in the window, and the clock fell with a crash. There were handfuls of Mr. Todd's sandy whiskers. The vases fell off the mantelpiece, the canisters fell off the shelf, the kettle fell off the hob. Tommy Brock put his foot in a jar of raspberry jam, and the boiling water out of the kettle fell upon the tail of Mr. Todd. When the kettle fell, Tommy Brock, who was still grinning, happened to be uppermost, and he rolled Mr. Todd over and over like a log, out at the door. Then the snarling and whirring went on outside, and they rolled over the bank and downhill, bumping over the rocks. There will never be any love lost between Tommy Brock and Mr. Todd. As soon as the coast was clear, Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Bunny came out of the bushes. Now for it! Run in, Cousin Benjamin! Run in and get them while I watch the door! But Benjamin was frightened. Oh no! They are coming back! No, they are not. Yes, they are! What dreadful bad language! I think they have fallen down the stone quarry. Still, Benjamin hesitated, and Peter kept pushing him in. Be quick, it's all right. Shut the oven door, Cousin Benjamin, so that he won't miss them. Decidedly, there were lively doings in Mr. Todd's kitchen. At home in the rabbit hole, things had not been quite comfortable. After quarreling at supper, Flopsy and old Mr. Bouncer had passed the sleepless night and quarreled again at breakfast. Old Mr. Bouncer could no longer deny that he had invited company into the rabbit hole, but he refused to reply to the questions and reproaches of Flopsy. The day passed heavily. 
Old Mr. Bouncer, very sulky, was huddled up in a corner, barricaded with a chair. Flopsy had taken away his pipe and hidden the tobacco. She had been having a complete turnout in spring cleaning to relieve her feelings. She had just finished. Old Mr. Bouncer, behind his chair, was wondering anxiously what she would do next. In Mr. Todd's kitchen, amidst the wreckage, Benjamin Bunny picked his way to the oven nervously through a thick cloud of dust. He opened the oven door, felt inside, and found something warm and wriggling. He lifted it out carefully and rejoined Peter Rabbit. I've got them. Can we get away? Shall we hide, Cousin Peter? Peter pricked his ears. Distant sounds of fighting still echoed in the wood. Five minutes afterwards, two breathless rabbits came scuttering away from bull banks, half carrying, half dragging a sack between them, bumpity bump over the grass. They reached home safely and burst into the rabbit hole. Great was old Mr. Bouncer's relief and Flopsy's joy when Peter and Benjamin arrived in triumph with the young family. The rabbit babies were rather tumbled and very hungry. They were fed and put to bed. They soon recovered. A new long pipe and a fresh supply of rabbit tobacco was presented to Mr. Bouncer. He was rather upon his dignity, but he accepted. Old Mr. Bouncer was forgiven, and they all had dinner. Then Peter and Benjamin told their story, but they had not waited long enough to be able to tell the end of the battle between Tommy Brock and Mr. Todd. End of chapter 17 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marlo Diane ForbiddenDragon.blogspot.com Great Big Treasury of Beatrix Potter by Beatrix Potter Chapter 18 the Tale of Pigling Bland Once upon a time there was an old pig called Aunt Pettitoes. She had eight of a family, four little girl pigs called Crosspatch, Suck Suck, Yock Yock, and Spot, and four little boy pigs called Alexander, Pigling Bland, Chin Chin, and Stumpy. Stumpy had had an accident to his tail. The eight little pigs had very fine appetites. Yes, 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 they eat, and indeed they do eat, said Aunt Pettitoes, looking at her family with pride. Suddenly there were fearful squeals. Alexander had squeezed inside the hoops of the pig trough and stuck. Aunt Pettitoes and I dragged him out by the hind legs. Chin Chin was already in disgrace. It was washing day, and he had eaten a piece of soap. And presently, in a basket of clean clothes, we found another dirty little pig. Chet tut tut whichever is this? grunted Aunt Pettitoes. Now all the pig family are pink, or pink with black spots, but this little pig child was smutty black all over. When it had been popped into a tub, it proved to be yock yock. I went into the garden. There I found Crosspatch and Suck Suck rooting up carrots. I whipped them myself and led them out by the ears. Crosspatch tried to bite me. On petty toes, on petty toes, you are a worthy person, but your family is not well brought up. Every one of them has been in mischief, except Spot and Pigling Bland. Yes, yes, sighed on petty toes and they drink bucketfuls of milk. I shall have to get another cow. Good little Spot shall stay at home to do the housework, but the others must go. Four little boy pigs and four little girl pigs are too many altogether. 
Yes, 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 said Aunt Pettitoes. There will be more to eat without them. So Chin Chin and Suck Suck went away in a wheelbarrow, and Stumpy, Yock Yock, and Crosspatch rode away in a cart, and the other two little boy pigs, Pigling Bland and Alexander, went to market. We brushed their coats, we curled their tails, and washed their little faces, and wished them good-bye in the yard. Aunt Petty Toes wiped her eyes with a large pocket handkerchief. Then she wiped Pigling Bland's nose and shed tears. Then she wiped Alexander's nose and shed tears. Then she passed the handkerchief to Spot. Aunt Petty Toes sighed and grunted and addressed those little pigs as follows. Now, Pigling Bland, son Pigling Bland, you must go to market. Take your brother Alexander by the hand. Mind your Sunday clothes, and remember to blow your nose. On petty toes passed round the handkerchief again. Beware of traps. Hen roosts, bacon and eggs. Always walk upon your hind legs. Higgling Bland, who was a sedate little pig, looked solemnly at his mother. A tear trickled down his cheek. On petty toes turned to the other. Now, son Alexander, take the hand. Wee, 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 giggled Alexander. Take the hand of your brother, Pigling Bland. You must go to the market. Mind, wee, 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 interrupted Alexander again. You put me out, said on petty toes. Observe signposts and milestones. Do not gobble herring bones. And remember, said I impressively, if you once cross the county boundary, you cannot come back. Alexander, you are not attending. Here are two licenses permitting two pigs to go to market in Lancashire. Attend, Alexander. I have had no end of trouble in getting these papers from the policeman. Pigling Bland listened gravely. Alexander was hopelessly volatile. I pinned the papers for safety inside their waistcoat pockets. On petty toes gave to each a little bundle and ate conversation peppermints with appropriate moral sentiments and screws of paper. Then they started. Pigling Bland and Alexander trotted along steadily for a mile. At least Pigling Bland did. Alexander made the road half as long again by skipping from side to side. He danced about and pinched his brother, singing, This pig went to the market, this pig stayed at home, this pig had a bit of meat. Let's see what they have given us for dinner, Pigling. Pigling Bland and Alexander sat down and untied their bundles. Alexander gobbled up his dinner in no time. He had already eaten all his own peppermints. Give me one of yours, please, Pigling. But I wish to preserve them for emergencies, said Pigling Bland doubtfully. Alexander went into squeals of laughter. Then he pricked Pigling with the pin that had fastened his pig paper. And when Pigling slapped him, he dropped the pin and tried to take Pigling's pin, and the papers got mixed up. Pigling Bland reproved Alexander. But presently they made it up again and trotted away together, singing. Tom, Tom, the piper's son, stole a pig and away he ran, but all the tune that he could play was over the hills and far away. What's that, young sirs? Stole a pig? Where are your licenses? said the policeman. They had nearly run against him around a corner. Pigling Bland pulled out his paper. Alexander, after fumbling, handed over something scrumply. Two two-and-a-half-ounce conversation sweeties at three farthings. What's this? This ain't a license. Alexander's nose lengthened visibly. He had lost it. I had one. Indeed, I had, Mr. Policeman. It's not likely they let you start without. I am passing the farm. You may walk with me. Can I come back, too? 
inquired Pigling Bland. I see no reason, young sir. Your paper is all right. Pigling Bland did not like going on alone, and it was beginning to rain, but it is unwise to argue with the police. He gave his brother a peppermint and watched him out of sight. To conclude the adventures of Alexander, the policeman sauntered up to the house about tea time, followed by a damp, subdued little pig. I disposed of Alexander in the neighborhood. He did fairly well when he had settled down. Pigling Bland went on alone dejectedly. He came to crossroads and a signpost to Market Town, five miles. Over the hills, four miles. To Petty Toe's farm, three miles. Pigling Bland was shocked. There was little hope of sleeping in Market Town, and tomorrow was the hiring fair. It was deplorable to think how much time had been wasted by the frivolity of Alexander. He glanced wistfully along the road towards the hills, and then set off, walking obediently the other way, buttoning up his coat against the rain. He had never wanted to go, and the idea of standing all by himself in a crowded market, to be stared at, pushed and hired by some big strange farmer, was very disagreeable. "'I wish I could have a little garden and grow potatoes,' said Pigling Bland. He put his cold hand in his pocket and felt his paper. He put his other hand in his other pocket and felt another paper. Alexander's! Pigling squealed, then ran back frantically, hoping to overtake Alexander and the policeman. He took a wrong turn, several wrong turns, and was quite lost. It grew dark. The wind whistled, the trees creaked and groaned. Pigling Bland became frightened and cried, Wee, 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 I can't find my way home. After an hour's wandering, he got out of the wood. The moon shone through the clouds, and Pigling Bland saw a country that was new to him. The road crossed a moor. Below was a wide valley with a river twinkling in the moonlight, and beyond, in misty distance, lay the hills. He saw a small wooden hut, made his way to it, and crept inside. I am afraid it is a hen house, but what can I do? said Pigling Bland, wet and cold and quite tired out. Bacon and eggs, bacon and eggs, clucked a hen on a perch. Trap, 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 cackle, 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 scolded the disturbed cockerel. To market, to market, jiggity jig, clucked a broody white hen roosting next to him. Pigling Bland, much alarmed, determined to leave at daybreak. In the meantime, he and the hens fell asleep. In less than an hour, they were all awakened. The owner, Mr. Peter Thomas Piperson, came with a lantern and a hamper to catch six fowls to take to market in the morning. He grabbed the white hen roosting next to the cock. Then his eye fell upon Pigling Bland, squeezed up in a corner. He made a singular remark. Hello, here's another, seized Pigling by the scruff of the neck and dropped him into the hamper. Then he dropped in five more dirty, kicking, cackling hens upon the top of Pigling Bland. The hamper, containing six fowls and a young pig, was no light weight. It was taken downhill, unsteadily, with jerks. Pigling, although nearly scratched to pieces, contrived to hide the papers and peppermints inside his clothes. At last, the hamper was bumped down upon a kitchen floor, the lid was opened, and Pigling was lifted out. He looked up, blinking, and saw an offensively ugly elderly man, grinning from ear to ear. 
"'This one's come of himself, whatever,' said Mr. Piperson, "'turning Pigling's pockets inside out. "'He pushed the hamper into a corner, "'threw a sack over it to keep the hens quiet, "'put a pot on the fire, and unlaced his boots. "'Pigling Bland drew forward a copy stool, "'and sat on the edge of it, shyly warming his hands. "'Mr. Piperson pulled off a boot, "'and threw it against the wainscot at the further end of the kitchen. "'There was a smothered noise. "'Shut up!' said Mr. Piperson. "'Pigling Bland warmed his hands and eyed him. "'Mr. Piperson pulled off the other boot and flung it after the first. "'There was again a curious noise. "'Be quiet, will ye?' said Mr. Piperson. Higgling Bland sat on the very edge of the copy stool. Mr. Piperson fetched meal from a chest and made porridge. It seemed to Pigling that something at the further end of the kitchen was taking a suppressed interest in the cooking, but he was too hungry to be troubled by noises. Mr. Piperson poured out three platefuls, for himself, for Pigling, and a third, after glaring at Pigling. He put away with much scuffling and locked up. Pigling Bland ate his supper discreetly. After supper, Mr. Piperson consulted an almanac and felt Pigling's ribs. It was too late in the season for curing bacon, and he grudged his meal. Besides, the hens had seen this pig. He looked at the small remains of a flitch, side of bacon, and then looked undecidedly at Pigling. "'You may sleep on the rug,' said Mr. Peter Thomas Piperson. Pigling Bland slept like a top. In the morning, Mr. Piperson made more porridge. The weather was warmer. He looked how much meal was left in the chest and seemed dissatisfied. "'You'll likely be moving on again,' said he to Pigling Bland. Before Pigling could reply, a neighbor, who was giving Mr. Piperson and the hens a lift, whistled from the gate. Mr. Piperson hurried out with the hamper, enjoining Pigling to shut the door behind him and not meddle with naught. "'Or, I'll come back and skin ye,' said Mr. Piperson." It crossed Pigling's mind that, if he had asked for a lift too, he might still have been in time for market, but he distrusted Peter Thomas. After finishing breakfast at his leisure, Pigling had a look round the cottage. Everything was locked up. He found some potato peelings in a bucket in the back kitchen. Pigling ate the peel and washed up the porridge plates in the bucket. He sang while he worked. Tom with his pipe made such a noise, he called up all the girls and boys, and they all ran to hear him play over the hills and far away. Suddenly, a little smothered voice chimed in. Over the hills and a great way off, the wind shall blow my top knot off. Pigling Bland put down a plate, which he was wiping, and listened. After a long pause, Pigling went on tiptoe and peeped round the door into the front kitchen. There was nobody there. After another pause, Pigling approached the door of the lock cupboard and snuffed at the keyhole. It was quite quiet. After another long pause, Pigling pushed a peppermint under the door. It was sucked in immediately. In the course of the day, Pigling pushed in all his remaining six peppermints. When Mr. Piperson returned, he found Pigling sitting before the fire. He had brushed up the hearth and put on the pot to boil. The meal was not good at Abel. Mr. Piperson was very affable. He slapped Pigling on the back, made lots of porridge, and forgot to lock the meal chest. He did lock the cupboard door, but without properly shutting it. He went to bed early, 
and told Pigling upon no account to disturb him next day before twelve o'clock. Pigling Bland sat by the fire, eating his supper. All at once, at his elbow, a little voice spoke. My name is Pickwick. Make me more porridge, please. Pigling Bland jumped and looked round. A perfectly lovely little black Berkshire pig stood smiling beside him. She had twinkly little screwed-up eyes, a double chin, and a short turned-up nose. She pointed at Pigling's plate. He hastily gave it to her and fled to the meal-chest. "'How did you come here?' asked Pigling Bland. "'Stolen,' replied Pigwig, with her mouth full. Pigling helped himself to meal without scruple. "'What for?' "'Bacon, hams,' replied Pigwig cheerfully. "'Why on earth don't you run away?' exclaimed the horrified Pigling. "'I shall after supper.' said Pigwig decidedly. Pigling Bland made more porridge and watched her shyly. She finished a second plate, got up and looked about her, as though she were going to start. You can't go in the dark, said Pigling Bland. Pigwig looked anxious. Do you know your way by daylight? I know we can see this little white house from the hills across the river. Which way are you going, Mr. Pig? To market. I have two pig papers. I might take you to the bridge, if you have no objection, said Pigling, much confused and sitting on the edge of his copy stool. Pigwig's gratitude was such, and she asked so many questions, that it became embarrassing to Pigling Bland. He was obliged to shut his eyes and pretend to sleep. She became quiet, and there was a smell of peppermint. "'I thought you had eaten them,' said Pigling, waking suddenly. "'Only the corners,' replied Pigwig, studying the sentiments with much interest by the firelight. "'I wish you wouldn't. He might smell them through the ceiling,' said the alarmed Pigling." Pigwig put back the sticky peppermints into her pocket. "'Sing something,' she demanded. "'I am sorry. I—I I have a toothache,' said Pigling, much dismayed. "'Then I will sing,' replied Pigwig. "'You will not mind if I say itty to ditty? "'I—I have forgotten some of the words.' Pigling Bland made no objection. He sat with his eyes half shut and watched her. She wagged her head and rocked about, clapping time and singing in a sweet little grunty voice. A funny old mother pig lived in a sty, and three little piggies had she. Tiddy, tiddy, a ditty, umph, umph, umph. And the little piggy said, Wee, wee! She sang successfully through three or four verses. Only at every verse her head nodded a little lower, and her little twinkly eyes closed up. Those three little piggies grew peaky and lean and lean, they might very well be. For somehow they couldn't say oomph, 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 and they wouldn't say wee, wee, wee. Somehow they couldn't say. Pigwig's head bobbed lower and lower until she rolled over, a little round ball, fast asleep on the hearth rug. Pigling Bland, on tiptoe, covered her up with a nanny macassar. He was afraid to go to sleep himself. For the rest of the night, he sat listening to the chirping of the crickets and to the snores of Mr. Piperson overhead. Early in the morning, between dark and daylight, Pigling tied up his little bundle and woke up Pigwig. She was excited and half-frightened. But, but it's dark, 
How can we find our way? The cock is crowed. We must start before the hens come out. They might shout to Mr. Piperson. Pigwig sat down again and commenced to cry. Come away, Pigwig. We can see when we get used to it. Come, I can hear them clucking. Higgling had never said sh to a hen in his life, being peaceable. Also, he remembered the hamper. He opened the house door quietly and shut it after them. There was no garden. The neighborhood of Mr. Piperson's was all scratched up by fowls. They slipped away, hand in hand, across an untidy field to the road. Tom, Tom, the piper's son, stole a pig, and away he ran, but all the tune that he could play was over the hills and far away. Come, Pigwig, we must get to the bridge before folks are stirring. Why do you want to go to the market, Pigling? inquired Pigwig. The sun rose while they were crossing the moor, a dazzling of light over the tops of the hills. The sunshine crept down the slopes into the peaceful green valleys, where little white cottages nestled in gardens and orchards. That's Westmoreland, said Pigwig. She dropped Pigling's hand and commenced to dance, singing, presently. I don't want... I want to grow potatoes. Have a peppermint, said Pigwig. Pigling Bland refused quite crossly. Does your poor toothy hurt? inquired Pigwig. Pigling Bland grunted. Pigwig ate the peppermint herself and followed the opposite side of the road. Pigwig, keep under the wall. There's a man plowing. Pigwig crossed over. They hurried down the hill toward the county boundary. Suddenly, Pigling stopped. He heard wheels. Slowly, jogging up the road below them, came a tradesman's cart. The reins flapped on the horse's back. The grocer was reading a newspaper. Take that peppermint out of your mouth, Pigwig. We may have to run. Don't say one word, leave it to me, and in sight of the bridge, said poor Pigling, nearly crying. He began to walk frightfully lame, holding Pigwig's arm. The grocer, intent upon his newspaper, might have passed them, if his horse had not shied and snorted. He pulled the cart crossways and held down his whip. Hello, where are you going to? Pigling Bland stared at him vacantly. Are you deaf? Are you going to market? Pigling nodded slowly. I thought as much. It was yesterday. Show me your license. Pigling stared at the off hind shoe of the grocer's horse, which had picked up a stone. The grocer flicked his whip. Papers? Pig license? Pigling fumbled in all his pockets and handed up the papers. The grocer read them, but still seemed dissatisfied. This here pig is a young lady. Is her name Alexander? Pigwig opened her mouth and shut it again. Pigling coughed asthmatically. The grocer ran his finger down the advertisement column of his newspaper. Lost, stolen, or strayed. 10S Reward. He looked suspiciously at Pigwig. Then he stood up in the trap and whistled for the plowman. You wait here while I drive on and speak to him, said the grocer, gathering up the reins. He knew that pigs are slippery, but surely such a very lame pig could never run. Not yet, Pigwig. He will look back. The grocer did so. He saw the two pigs, stock still in the middle of the road. Then he looked over at his horse's heels. It was lame also. The stone took some time to knock out. After he got to the plowman. 
Now, Pigwig, now, said Pigling Bland. Never did any pigs run as these pigs ran. They raced and squealed and pelted down the long white hill towards the bridge. Little fat Pigwig's petticoats fluttered, and her feet went pitter-patter-pitter as she bounded and jumped. They ran and they ran and they ran down the hill and across a short cut on level green turf at the bottom, between pebble-beds and rushes. They came to the river, they came to the bridge, they crossed it hand in hand, then over the hills and far away she danced with Pigling Bland. End of the Tale of Pigling Bland Recorded by Marlo Diane March 6, 2006 Piscid West, Prince Edward Island This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ginger and Pickles by Beatrix Potter Dedicated with very kind regards to old Mr. John Taylor, who thinks he might pass as a dormouse. Three years in bed, and never a grumble. Once upon a time there was a village shop. The name over the window was Ginger and Pickles. It was a little small shop, just the right size for dolls. Lucinda and Jane Doll Cook always bought their groceries at Ginger and Pickles. The counter inside was a convenient height for rabbits. Ginger and Pickles sold red spotty pocket handkerchiefs at a penny three farthings. They also sold sugar and snuff and galoshes. In fact, although it was such a small shop, it sold nearly everything, except a few things that you want in a hurry, like bootlaces, hairpins, and mutton chops. Ginger and Pickles were the people who kept the shop. Ginger was a yellow tomcat, and Pickles was a terrier. The rabbits were always a little bit afraid of Pickles. The shop was also patronised by mice, only the mice were rather afraid of Ginger. Ginger usually requested Pickles to serve them, because he said it made his mouth water. I cannot bear, said he, to see them going out at the door carrying their little parcels. I have the same feeling about rats, replied Pickles, but it would never do to eat our customers. They would leave us and go to Tabitha Twitchett's. On the contrary, they would go nowhere, replied Ginger gloomily. Tabitha Twitchett kept the only other shop in the village. She did not give credit. But there is no money in what is called the till. Ginger and Pickles gave unlimited credit. Now the meaning of credit is this. When a customer buys a bar of soap, instead of the customer pulling out a purse and paying for it, she says she will pay another time. And Pickles makes a low bow and says, With pleasure, madam, and it is written down in a book. The customers come again and again, and buy quantities in spite of being afraid of ginger and pickles. The customers came in crowds every day, and bought quantities, especially the toffee customers. But there was always no money. They never paid for as much as a penny worth of peppermints. But the sales were enormous, ten times as large as Tabitha Twitchett's. And there was always no money. Ginger and Pickles were obliged to eat their own goods. Pickles ate biscuits, and Ginger ate a dried haddock. They ate them by candlelight, after the shop was closed. It is very uncomfortable. I am afraid I shall be summoned. I have tried in vain to get a license upon credit at the post office, said Pickles. The place is full of policemen. I met one as I was coming home. Let us send in the bill again to Samuel Whiskers, Ginger. He owes twenty-two and nine for bacon. 
I do not believe that he intends to pay at all, replied Ginger. When it came to January 1st, there was still no money, and Pickles was unable to buy a dog license. It is very unpleasant. I am afraid of the police, said Pickles. It is your own fault for being a terrier. I do not require a license, and neither does Kip, the collie dog. And I feel sure that Anna Maria pockets things. Where are all the cream crackers? You have eaten them yourself, replied Ginger. Ginger and Pickles retired into the back parlour. They did accounts. They added up sums and sums and sums. Samuel Whiskers has run up a bill as long as his tail. He has had an ounce and three quarters of snuff since October. What is seven pounds of butter at one and three? And a stick of sealing wax and four matches? Send in all the bills again to everybody, with compliments, replied Ginger. After a time they heard a noise in the shop, as if something had been pushed in at the door. They came out of the back parlour. There was an envelope lying on the counter, and a policeman writing in a notebook. Pickles nearly had a fit. He barked and he barked and made little rushes. Bite him, Pickles, bite him, spluttered Ginger behind a sugar barrel. He's only a German doll. The policeman went on writing in his notebook. Twice he put his pencil in his mouth, and once he dipped it in the treacle. Pickles barked till he was hoarse, but still the policeman took no notice. He had bead eyes, and his helmet was sewed on with stitches. At length, on his last little rush, Pickles found that the shop was empty. The policeman had disappeared. But the envelope remained. Do you think that he has gone to fetch a real live policeman? I'm afraid it is a summons, said Pickles. No, replied Ginger, who had opened the envelope. It is the rates and taxes. Three pounds nineteen, eleven and three quarters. Pounds are British money. The nineteen is shillings and then pence. This is the last straw, said Pickles. Let us close the shop. They put up the shutters and left, but they have not removed from the neighbourhood. In fact, some people wish they had gone further. Ginger is living in the Warren. Game preserve for rabbits. I do not know what occupation he pursues. He looks stout and comfortable. Pickles is at present a gamekeeper. After a time, Mr. John Dormouse and his daughter began to sell peppermints and candles. But they did not keep self-fitting sixes, and it takes five mice to carry one seven-inch candle. The closing of the shop caused great inconvenience. Tabitha Twitchett immediately raised the price of everything a half penny, and she continued to refuse to give credit. Of course, there are the tradesmen's carts, the butcher, the fishman, and Timothy Baker. But a person cannot live on seed wigs and sponge cake and butter buns, not even when the sponge cake is as good as Timothy's. And Miss Dormouse refused to take back the ends when they were brought back to her with complaints. And when Mr. John Dormouse was complained to, he stayed in bed and would say nothing but very snug, which is not the way to carry on a retail business. Besides, the candles which they sell behave very strangely in warm weather. So everybody was pleased when Sally Hennypenny sent out a printed poster to say that she was going to reopen the shop. Henny's opening sale, grand cooperative jumble, Penny's penny prices. Come by, come try, come by. The poster really was most ticing. There was a rush upon the opening day. The shop was crammed with customers, and there were crowds of mice upon the biscuit canisters. Sally Hennypenny 
gets rather flustered when she tries to count our change, and she insists on being paid cash. But she is quite harmless. And she has laid in a remarkable assortment of bargains. There is something to please everybody. End of Ginger and Pickles <laughs>